The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning. Thank you for braving the treacherous weather and joining us this morning. So if you are new here, I pray that you feel the welcome love and that you are able to see a church that wants to proclaim Christ and Him alone. So will you join me in prayer? God, this is your church. This is your bride. This is your word. And these are your people. Open our ears and our hearts, and by your Spirit move. In your name we pray. Amen. Johnny, said the grammar teacher, please let me, uh, please tell me what, what it is when I say, I love, you love, he loves. Well, replied Johnny, that's one of those deals where somebody's going to get shot. So love can be a complicated thing, can't it? Uh, particularly around the holidays as uh, we're with our family members. So uh, as we're getting ready to turn the page on a new year, and uh, this time on a new decade, I want to do, uh, turn our hearts in the direction of how we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In particular, this morning, Um, I want us to focus on what it is to love my brother. So our text this morning is going to be coming from 1 John 4, 19 through 21. So if you would go ahead and turn there, 1 John 4, 19 through 21. We're going to have a very simple outline. It consists of two main points. And that is, we're going to make some simple observations about the text. And then we're going to make four points of application. I know that seems really simple, and um, no, this won't be 10 minutes. That's, I guess, good or bad, however you want to look at it. Um, But uh, the reason we're going to spend a lot of time on application, and the reason why I want to spend so much time on application is is because this, this text is very weighty, and what makes it weighty is its application. So if you would, let's, let's read the passage. 19 through 21, chapter 4, 1 John. It says, We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has seen, who he has not seen. And, And this commandment, and this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. So, simple observations. Simple observations. We're going to look at two, two main things. I want you to see in verse 19, this all starts with God. The only reason why we love is because God loved first. God's the initiator. So that's why we love. The second is our love for God is inextricably linked to loving our brother. And that should be profound and really shake us to the core. Usually it doesn't. And the reason why is because we usually are not thinking very deeply about it. Um, The thought process is, I love my brother because I don't hate him. (laughs) That's tight logic, but it doesn't work biblically. So, so the first point, verse 19, the first point is, is a means to the second point. But the second point serves as validation to the first point. So they're, they're connected to each other. So I won't love without God, but if I'm not loving my brother, it, it's an in indication of my love for God. And, and so that should... 
again, it, it should be important to us. And if we look at the whole of, of the epistle of 1 John and kind of take in the message, if I don't love my brother, according to 1 John 4, 8, I'm not a lover, and thus I don't love God. And then according to 1 John 2, 3 through 6, if I don't know him, the truth's not in me. And then if I look at chapter 1, if I'm not walking in the truth, I don't have fellowship with Christ. So do, do you see the implications? The implications are if I don't love my brother, then I, I don't have a relationship with God. I can't, I can't divorce those two things. So, so I, I do want to get your attention this morning. I, it's, these, these are critical things. And so I... I don't want us to think of it as loving my brother is salvation, that I gain salvation through loving my brother. That's not it. Remember remember the points, right? I don't love my brother until I love God. That relationship needs to come first, and then comes loving my brother. All we're talking about when we're talking about loving our brother is it's an indication. It's an indication of something. So if I don't love my brother, it indicates no love or lack of love for God. And so that should get our attention. That should kind of shake us at our core. And so this morning, I want us to focus on four areas of application. And um, according to 1 John 3, 16 through 17, we are to love our brother, we're to love, not only in in action, but in word and in, uh, in deed and in truth. In deed and in truth. In deed and in truth is, is what the passage says in 1 John 3, 16 through 17. And, and so what I wanted to flesh out is what is this deed and truth aspect. And so I just picked four points of application. And the reason why I picked these four is as I've been at Southside for 20 years now, um, there are things I've observed. And there are good things that I've observed. Um, I've observed that this body is um, a self-sacrificial lover. Um, that's 1 John 3, 16 through 17. Uh, they, they, they love self-sacrificially. When there are needs, you guys go out and love. I love that. That encourages my heart. But um, is that all it is to love my brother, is just to self-sacrificially give? And that's what I, I want to focus in on is that's, that's not it. That's not all it is. It's that and, and also. So four points of application. First one, here's what I want us to grow in. I want us to grow in vulnerability. So it may not be readily apparent um, how that connects to loving my brother, but uh, allow me to connect some dots for you. The scripture commands us to do more than just spend time together. Uh, it's, it's more than just um, being in attendance. It's more than just being present on Sunday. Uh, instead, the scripture uses the term one another. We're to one another. And here are a few of the passages that deal with one anothering. And I apologize, I'm going to have to go through this very quickly. There is a stream that will be up online where you can can play and pause and play and pause and play and pause. So um, I apologize for the quickness of this, but um, due, due to time. Here are the passages. We are called to be devoted to one another in love, Romans 12.10. Give preference to one another in honor, Romans 12.10. Be of the same mind towards one another, Romans 15.5. Build up one another, Romans 14.19. Accept one another, Romans 15.7. Admonish one another, Romans 15.14. Care for one another, 1 Corinthians 12, 25. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, 2. Show forbearance to one another, Ephesians 4, 2. Be kind to one another, Ephesians 4, 32. Forgive one another, Ephesians 4, 32. Regard one another as more important than ourselves, Philippians 2, 3. Do not lie to one another, Colossians 3, 9. Comfort one another, 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Encourage one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Be at peace with one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.13. Pursue good to one another, 1 Thessalonians 5.15. Speak evil against, uh, do not speak evil against one another, James 4.11. 
not to complain against one another, James 5.16, clothe ourselves with humility towards one another, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. So, where in that is there room for me to not be vulnerable with others? You see, if I really look at all these texts and what it is inviting me to do, it's not even exhaustive, by the way. There's a lot more on in other passages. What it's inviting me to do is to very much be a part of your life. Very much be a part of your life. And, and I know I can hear the pushback, a little bit of pushback. So you expect me to be this with 400 people. No. That's a smokescreen argument, by the way. It's usually a person that's feeling around to try and find the minimum. Where's the bar? Where's that minimum bar? Is it five people? Is it 10 people? What is it? I'll do that so that I can check the box on what it is to one another. Do you think that that is the intention of these scriptures, is for us to go to the bare minimum? No. You know what that is. You all have limitations. You have limitations on your time, I get it. You have limitations on your energy, I get it. But if you love no one, if you're vulnerable with no one, that's an indication of really where you're at. C.S. Lewis put it this way. To love at all is to be vulnerable. Love anything and your heart will be wrong and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully around with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. What do we not like about being vulnerable? Let's be honest. To be vulnerable opens me up to a world of hurt, of pain. I've got trouble enough of my own. I don't need someone else's. So what do we typically do? Uh, we limit people from knowing our fears, our struggles, our weaknesses. We limit ourselves from knowing other people's. We're suspicious of others' motives. We're quick to be offended, which validates our reason for self-protection and isolation. We keep ourselves apathetic toward everyone else's issues while concerning ourselves only with our own. So the things that we usually do keeps us from being vulnerable. However, 1 Corinthians 13, 5 through 7, as it describes love, we're told that love's not offended, it forgives wrongs, it bears up under all pressures, it believes the best of, about people. And, and as you see, everything there with regard to love contradicts the way we typically think. So quite simply, loving my brother requires me to be vulnerable. So, therefore, if I'm not vulnerable, I'm not loving my brother. And we already went over the implications of that. Do you see that? This is important. So for me to just lock myself away isn't loving my brother. And that's in indicating something. You can't love God. It's not just me and Jesus that attitude, it's just me and Jesus. No, it's not it. If you love him, if you love him, it pushes me outside of myself. It pushes me out to love the world. So if this, this is hitting you, would you stop right now? And would you ask God to work in this area of your heart? Would you? And I say this because I love you. Because I want you to grow in him. I know it's hard. But I love you, 
And I want you to grow in Him. Next area. <clears throat> As if that one wasn't hard enough. I want us to focus on the area of applying what it is to forgive one another. This is another one. Forgiving one another. So if God is calling me to be vulnerable, He is opening me up and requiring me to possibly be hurt. Which now opens up the possibility of me resenting you. And yet the Scripture commands us, commands us with regard to forgiveness. Again, I'm going to go through these quickly. In the Scripture, believers are called to forgive our debtors, Matthew 6, 12. Forgive anyone without limit, Matthew 18, 21 through 22. Forgive from the heart, not just in word, Matthew 18, 23 through 35. Unconditionally forgive everyone, Mark 11, 25 through 26. Forgive no matter the evil done to us, 1 Corinthians 13, 5. See that our forgiveness is an indicator of our love for God, Luke 7, 47. Forgive the way Christ forgave, Luke 23, 34. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Put aside bitterness and forgive the way we are forgiven in Christ, Ephesians 4, 30 through 32. Not become bitter, but forgive every complaint, Colossians 3, 12 through 15. Not let a root of bitterness take hold of us, Hebrews 12, 14 through 17. Be patient with all and do not seek revenge, 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 through 18. So again, this, this list isn't exhaustive. However, it's clear. If we're going to claim love for our brother, we must forgive. So what do we do instead? What do we do instead? We withdraw from the people or persons who hurt us. We become embittered and hold a grudge against them. We avoid conversations and or any interaction with them. We plan to take or imagine taking revenge. We gossip or slander the person who hurts us. The scripture is clear, though. No matter the pain that was inflicted, the believer is called to forgive. As often as the offense comes up in action, word, deed, or even in my own thoughts, They are to be met with forgiveness that is found in the forgiveness that we are to have in Christ. So those two things are connected too. If you're struggling with forgiveness, perhaps you don't know what you've been forgiven in Christ. And I, again, I'd encourage you to look at Matthew 18, 23 through, through 35. So to refuse to forgive... Or to say that we're unable to forgive our brother is, is to not love them. And according to 1 John 4, 20 through 21, to not love my brother is to not love God. And to not love God is to not know him. The implications are damning. If we think we know God and won't forgive, dear friend, we're fooling ourselves into thinking we have a relationship with someone we don't. And those are eternal implications. So if this is hitting you, you may be asking, what do I do instead? Well, if you're sitting there with an unforgiving heart, confess that right now to God. Don't waste any time. And count on the forgiveness that you find in Christ and then go forgive out of the forgiveness that you have been shown. And the weight of the forgiveness that you are shown is eternal. An eternal weight of sin damns me rightly to hell. Damns me rightly to hell. And yet in Christ, I am forgiven all of that and then given more because of His graciousness. That should just overflow from the believer from a person who knows and has a relationship with Christ, we should be forgiving. So I know it's hard, 
but I care too much about your soul to just let this pass by. I don't want you to just feel comfortable about a relationship with God you may or may not have. I want you to know Him. I want you to have life and have it abundantly as Christ has called you. I love you. And I want you to grow in Him. As if that wasn't hard enough. Let's go to our third point. And um, our third point is to love our brother is to admonish one another. Now, I know I am begging, biting off a big one, and I am begging for all kinds of trouble in doing this. However, this is something we need to do in maturity. If, if I don't stand up here and teach you how to admonish one another rightly, I am not doing my job as an under-shepherd well at all. Because we are all going to step on each other's toes. It's going to happen. Right? Particularly if I'm calling us, and it's not me, it's God, calling us to be vulnerable, then we're going to step on each other's toes. And, and if the Scripture is calling us to forgive then what do I do with the situation where I just had a person step on my toes? Do I just let it pass by? And so this is where admonishment comes in. And if we don't know how to do it rightly, we're either not going to do it, which is not loving our brother, by the way, or we're going to do it so poorly that it just rips the body apart. Or... Worse yet, we'll just leave. We'll just leave. I can't, can't handle it, so I'm just going to leave. None of those are correct options. We must do this, and we must do it well. We must do it rightly. We must do it for the glory of God, for the unity of His body. So, yeah, that's why I'm going to bite this off. First of all, I want you to understand... We're definitely called to address one another. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And Romans 15, 14 both call us to do so. So there are two things to keep in mind. First, to not address the offense is to let the one who did it continue in it. Does continuing in the offense glorify God? No. So we kind of become party to it by letting someone continue. Second, to not address the offense is to let someone, something that affected my relationship with the person go unaddressed. Right? I'm hurt, and that affects the intimacy of our relationship. It, it's, it's, it's akin to being in a rowboat, two people, one person is making holes in the boat, and the other person is patching them. Now, that's great, but here's the problem. How do I get the holes to stop? Not, not simply by just patching them, right? Because we are called to forgive. That's, that's a good patch. But it's not stopping the holes from being drilled. It's, it's to tell the person, stop drilling the holes. And, and if I don't, eventually the boat is swamped, Right? Because it's going to let a little in, and a little in, and a little in, and begin. And eventually, a little becomes a lot. And eventually, the boat is swamped, just like your relationship with that person. Why? Because you won't address it. You won't talk to them. Because I don't want to be vulnerable. So let's deal with a little bit of pushback. Um, James 4, 11 through 12, Matthew 7, 1. If I pull those verses out in isolation, don't understand them properly, I can say, the scripture commands me not to judge. No. No. <laughs> That's not what those scriptures are saying at all. Let me give you the scriptures that explicitly command us to judge, and in what context. Okay? When there is sin, we are called to go to our brother. Matthew 18, 15 through 17. We are called to admonish one another. That's Romans 15, 14. 
We are called to judge those inside the body, not outside in the world. God judges them. That's not our business. That's God's business. Okay? And that's 1 Corinthians 5, 12 through 13. We are called to be faithful to a relationship even where there is something hard to say. Proverbs 27, 6. We are called to judge non-hypocritically. That's Matthew 7, 1 through 5. That's really the context of that passage. If I just stop at verse 1, sure, I can walk away and say, I'm not supposed to judge. No, that's not what it says. Read the whole thing. So in all of these cases, we're called to judge, and we're called to judge believers, and we're called to judge them rightly, and the standard by which we are called to judge them is not our own. It is the truth of God's Word. So how do we do this? How do we address offenses? So here are some things to keep in mind when you're confronting one another. Again, I'll go quickly. It should be done out of love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all that you do be done in love. It should be focused on preserving the unity we have in Christ. Colossians 3, 14. Ephesians 4, 3. There's a point to why you're doing this. You do it out of love, and you do it to preserve the unity. Not create it. Preserve it. That implies it's already there, and it is already there. If you're believers in Christ, we have unity in Christ. He doesn't want us separated. He wants us unified. You do it with unity in mind. It should be done in private, at least at first, one-on-one, Matthew 18, 15. You don't go talk to a whole bunch of other people. You go talk to that person. It should be done at the right time. Proverbs 27, 14. He who blesses his neighbor with a loud voice early in the morning, it shall be reckoned a curse to him. Pick your timing well, right? If it's a busy situation, don't just grab someone away. Come here, come here, come here, come here. Bad timing. Pick good timing. It should be done having already forgiven the offense. Okay? Make, make the connection here. This is not dependent upon whether or not they say sorry. Ephesians 4.32 says we forgive. Don't withhold your forgiveness until they say they're sorry. No. We're called to forgive. We are called to forgive irrespective of whether or not the other person ever apologizes or acknowledges the wrong. So if you're going to go to this person, you better go having already forgiven them of the offense or it will not go well. It should be done assuming the best about the other person's motives. 1 Corinthians 13, 7. It's possible that there was a misunderstanding. It's possible that there was a misunderstanding. If you don't assume that, you're just going to go in assuming that that person's intentions were wrong. It should be done in kindness, patience, and humility. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. It should not be done, uh, it should not be a judgment based upon conscience issues. Romans 14, 1 through 23. That's the big one. If you didn't hear it, about five weeks ago, Ken preached on this very passage. If you missed it, Listen to it before going talking to that person. Because the last thing I want you to do is to go to a person and say, you're in sin because you wear open-toed shoes. That's not it. That's not a sin issue. It's a conscience issue. Right? So don't, don't address each other about conscience issues. We're not to speak evil of the person to others before, during, or after we address the issue. James 4, 11 through 12. Don't use labels like they're toxic, they're destructive, they're fill in the blank phobic. Don't use those. That's not loving your brother. That's slapping them with a label. Address the issues. We're not to slander the other person before, during, or after we speak to them. Colossians 3.8. We are to judge according to the truth only. And not out of hypocrisy, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Ask yourself the question, why does this bother me? Does it bother you because it reminds you of the person you know best, i.e. yourself? Boy, they have a real pride issue. (laughs) I would venture a guess you do too. Work on your own heart is the Matthew 7. Work on your own heart first. 
and then address your brother. Then do it rightly. We should remember that God is the final judge. And we're, to, we're called to peace. That's Romans 12, 18 through 21. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. What if they don't apologize? What if they don't apologize? What if they pick up what you're addressing and throw it back in your face? What if? What if? Don't be afraid. Go to them in love. Go to them out of love for them and address it. And what if they do? Well, you can, you can rest in a good God who's in control and will judge and judge rightly. Vengeance belongs to him. The final judgment belongs to him, not me. Addressing the person shouldn't be about my being right. It should be about God being glorified. So yes, to do this is a tall order. It's going to be uncomfortable. Confrontation is something that I don't believe anybody likes, truly. However, remember, if you're a believer, friend, you have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God. And you have the Word of God. You're fully equipped and able to do this and do it rightly and do it well. So remember, let's just tie this back to 1 John 4, 19 through 21 again. If I'm unwilling to address things with my brother, don't love my brother. I'm not loving my brother. So I'm not loving God. Again, I don't get to just sit here and say, it's me and God. It's just you and me, Jesus. No. You and God requires me to love you. Matter of fact, I want to love you. So if this is hitting you, if this is convicting you, you need to have this conversation. Do it rightly. Do it in the power of the Spirit. And again, I say these things, these difficult, hard things, not because I like to make you uncomfortable. It's because I love you. I want you to grow in Him. As if that wasn't difficult enough. I give us our fourth point of application. Which connects to our third. We should receive correction well. This is our fourth point. Receive correction from one another. We should do it well. So if we're going to have these tough conversations with one another... If we're going to admonish one another, someone's going to be on the other side of that conversation. Right? And eventually, it's going to be you, and it's going to be me. So how do we do that? How do I love my brother when I'm receiving correction, receiving admonishment? So here are some scriptures that I, I want to encourage you with about receiving correction. We are to delight in kind, righteous correction. Psalms 141.5 We either love knowledge or we're stupid based upon whether or not we receive correction. These are the words of Proverbs 12.1. It actually uses that word translated stupid. So if you've got your kid pulling on your shoulder and saying, Mommy said the S word, yes. <laughs> I did. But that's, that's what's spoken of, of a person who will not receive correction. Um, scoffers are known to hate correction, according to Proverbs 18.12. We demonstrate a love for life and wisdom when we listen to correction. Proverbs 15.31-32. If we continue to reject correction, eventually we'll find ourselves broken beyond repair. Proverbs 29, 1. We demonstrate that we really just want our own way if we won't listen to other people. Proverbs 18, 1. That's just a brief summary again. Not exhaustive. So we, we love our brother by receiving correction. 
So here are things I want us to keep in mind when we're receiving correction. Okay? First, <laughs> we should not look at correction as an opportunity to love my brother by telling them their faults. It's not tit for tat. Right? You corrected me, now I'm going to correct you. Yeah, you might need to correct them, but this is not the time. Remember we talked about timing? That's not the time. This is your time to be corrected. We should not seek to justify ourselves when corrected. But, 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 no, okay. I get it. There, there might be understanding, but don't seek to just protect yourself. We should apologize for the pain that we've caused. It's, it's not a if I hurt you, if that person is saying that you did. It's another way of justifying ourselves. If what we're being addressed on is sin, we need to repent to God first and then to the other person. If it's not sin, but a misunderstanding, we need to seek to grow in how to love our brother. You did, we did something to offend you. I shouldn't say, you need to get over it. You need to grow up. Hmm. Is that receiving correction? Hmm. should be looking at it in terms of, how can I love you? How, well, how do I think of you as more important than myself? It's, it's not about me. It's about God's glory. It's about God's glory. I don't want to offend anybody. So far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. So I'll say it one more time. To receive correction is to love my brother. To, to reject correction is to not love my brother. And then how can I say that I love God? So if this is hitting you, would you repent before God about not having a heart that's willing to receive correction? May we humble ourselves so that the next time we love our brothers better, demonstrating a genuine love for God. And please remember the reason why I'm, I'm going into these issues is because I love you. Because I love you. And I want you to grow in Christ. So, in closing, let me summarize what we've gone over. First, the only reason why we love, again, I'm just going to go back to this. This is 1 John 4.19. The only reason why we love is because we were loved first. Second, loving God means definitively, I love my brother. And third, we fleshed out four applications of what that looks like. This isn't exhaustive. These are just four areas that I really want us to grow in as a church in this coming new year. And those four areas were, were being vulnerable, forgiving, admonishing, and receiving correction. So given all of this, please, please listen. I, I want us to walk away from here with a deeper desire to grow in love. I know these items are weighty and may seem uh, overwhelming right now. But keep in mind, happy, easy times, happy, easy times are just God's gracious respites in between times of growth. We don't grow in ease we grow in difficulty. We grow in trial. And he's a good God to do that, according to James 1. Consider it all joy. Growth is hard. Loving is hard. But the proof of genuine love for others is not found in those who love us in return, but in the pain, rejection, and apathy of those who do not. That's Genuine love proved out. And God is good and gracious to put us in situations where the person on the other side is not loving. 
Because he's faithful to show us whether or not we are. So I close with this. Dr. Alexander McLaren used to tell of a man of great intellectual power whom he longed to win. To do so, the famous preacher preached a whole series of sermons dealing with intellectual difficulties. To the doctor's delight, the man came shortly after and said, to, uh, said he had become convinced, a convinced Christian and wanted to join the church. Overjoyed, the doctor said, and which of my sermons was it that removed your doubts? Your sermon, said the other. It wasn't any of your sermons. The thing that set me thinking was that, I, that a poor woman came out of the church beside me and stumbled on the steps. When I put out my hand to help her, she smiled and said, thank you. And then added, do you love Jesus Christ, my blessed Savior? He means everything to me. I did not then, but I thought about it. I found I was on the wrong road. I still have many intellectual difficulties, but now he means everything to me. So it's not my sermons that will preach to a dying world, my friends. It's your love for one another. May he mean everything to you as you love each other and love others in this new year. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I thank you for your word. None of these things would be possible apart from you, apart from these things. God, I pray for our hearts now. I pray that those who who need to grow won't do so out of obligation, but will do so out of love for you. That it would bring us all to the end of ourselves and the beginning of you. May we honor you in 2020 and beyond in all that we do and say and think how we love you and love others. It's your name we pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.